Well, good afternoon. You know, I, I want to start right away, and I know we're going to fill up the room very quickly as people finish up lunch, but uh, we have just so much to talk about um, that I think that we should just go ahead and get started. So welcome to this session, um, uh, Better Health for Millennials. I'm super excited about this conversation. We have a, like an expert panel who has a very deep understanding and I think could help provide a lot of insight for those of you who are thinking about millennials as a particular use case. And personally, as a doctor for uh, adolescents and young adults, this is a particular passion of mine as well. So uh, we're super excited to be talking about this and we look forward to making this a dialogue. So just as a bit of an agenda, we'll start out, we'll sh I'll share with you a little bit about Samsung Health, what we're doing in digital health and where we're trying to go. And then we'll quickly ta start talking about millennials, kind of set a baseline. Let's kind of have a common understanding of what this population looks like, who they are, what they want, and why it's really important for us to think about how we design for them so, as it relates to also how we think about health. And then we'll get on to it, to the meat of the conversation, this panel discussion about how do we successfully design for, for millennials. And then we'll end with a Q&A. And I hope that you all have your questions ready um, as we get to that stage. So just a few talking points about Samsung Health. For us, our vision is better health for billions. That's a pretty big number, billions. But we feel like one of the few companies that are re really positioned to be able to do that. We're already in something like 60 to 70% of American homes and around the world. And if we can get people to help help them make better health decisions, uh, I, I think that there's a real opportunity there. And the thought model that we have is starting with the data, right? So from our wearables and from our smartphones, it's the heart rate data, the biosensor data, but also the metadata about how people use their phones and their wearables, but also including and keep bringing data in from the healthcare system, like electronic health records, pharma data. We could talk about geography. We could talk about um, socioeconomic status. Um, as well as genomics and genetics, and think about that whole 360 degree view, data view, of the user. But after that, it's just data, right? What, what is so what? What are we supposed to do with that? And so the next stage is to then start connecting those dots. Get that, you know, and to get that one plus one equals three, leading the user, the, uh, the patient, whoever it may be, to then develop an understanding, a new aha moment about their health. And finally, moving on to personalized services, right? So now we have a better understanding about your health. You know, uh, what do I do about it? And it's about delivering that right service um, at the right time to the right person. When they're primed, when they're ready to take that advice and do something about it. Here's a snapshot about our Samsung Health portfolio. And in general, we're in, in three general categories around consumer wellness, business solutions, and care solutions. And so our focus today will be on the consumer wellness side about our app, Samsung Health app and our wearables, but also we're very interested on the, in terms of business solutions, thinking about health in the corporate and employee space, whether it be in terms of corporate wellness, safety, and productivity, and also a really interesting area in digital insurance, thinking about how do we disrupt the way that policies uh, and premiums are set up, and also empowering the users so that they can have an impact on their, on their uh, policy as may they make healthy decisions. And finally, in care solutions, leveraging what we know and our expertise in the health and wellness space, and then starting to influence and move the needle in, inside healthcare. And we have some really interesting examples to talk about that as well. In terms of consumer wellness, you know, our, our, it, since we started in Samsung Health in around 2014, our focus has been around the general pillars of health, right? Sleep, exercise, diet, and stress. We've been developing our technology on our phones, adding value with the wearable to put those two streams of data together in a real-time way on their body as they collect that information, but also looking to partners, partners like all of you, to help build out this ecosystem. Our approach is around finding best-of-breed partners, finding win-win solutions and opportunities so that we can get at impacting and improving health overall. And just in a brief note, in terms of care, solu care solutions, and to show you how we're thinking about it, I was super excited that a few months ago, we, our uh, technology and our service with Kaiser Permanente was published in the New England Journal. Essentially, patients who have had a heart attack or a serious cardi cardiac event, the general recommendation is once they get home is to get uh, about 12 weeks 
of cardiac rehab. Exercise, diet, sleep, does that sound familiar? Things that we already know how to do really well, but starting to leverage those key areas could, and deliver a service through the smartwatch. It's already been deployed in about 3,000 patients. We have a commitment for thousands more. Um, in, and Kaiser is delighted and, um, and continue, we continue to expand within uh, that health system and certainly looking for other partners as we build out that solution, not just for cardiac use case cases. We can easily see how this general platform can then, then be used for pulmonary, orthopedics, chronic disease, and on and on. And so we're really excited about the progress that we've made and the, the market uh, kind of awareness that has been growing around that as well. So let's get to the topic um, that we're here to, uh, that we've all gathered to talk about today. Better health for millennials. Now, we're gonna be talking up in generalities, right? I mean, uh, the millennials are a very diverse group, probably the most diverse generation um, uh, in, in US history. Um, and there are gonna be big differences in how people think when they're from rural areas or, or more urban areas um, and for a variety of other factors. But for the purposes of this discussion, we're gonna commit to a couple generalities um, for example, their age, right? We're talking about people who are in their early 20s into, uh, to their late 30s. We're so are talking about um, you know, this particular generation, and I think what's really important to keep in mind is that it's a very large group. There are 73 million uh, millennials, which makes up about a quarter of the U.S. population. And if you, the next step to think about this then is, in fact, it's half of the U.S. workforce. So these uh, millennials are now going to be shaping our products, our services, um, our businesses, our economy, but also spending money um, in consuming. And they're going to be directing the way that, uh, and, and shaping you know, what the products that are being produced based on the decisions they make from their pocketbook. I think to get a, a bit of a snapshot about how they think is also is useful to look at the brands that they, they recognize. And this is the list of the top 10 millennial um, brands according to millennials. And so what comes very quickly is around technology, right? They're tech savvy, they're mobile first, they're digital. And for this generation, it's not like, oh yeah, before we used to send snail mail and now we use email. This is baseline for them, right? The products that are being produced by Samsung and a lot of the other technology companies um, and our peer technology companies is how life is. It's how it's always been in their minds. And so, so they expect that same thing for all other services. Now, just a couple stats to keep in mind as we think about health also. About 83% of them consider themselves in good or excellent health. And the way they think about health is a little bit different. It's not just mental health or physical health. It's all one about being health. It's not just about I'm not sick so I'm healthy. It's actually I'm healthy and I'm thriving and doing well, um, which is how they think about health. And as it relates to that, they think of, have very different expectations about the way that health services are delivered. So just like you know, their expectation about mail, for example, right? They want things to be instantaneous, convenient and fast, right? Rather than their personal doctor, for example, they may be trusting their peers, right? And look to them as, an, uh, as a really important influencer about the choices they make in their health. When it comes to payment, when it comes to telehealth, all those different services are really important and things that they would like to use. But as you can see, about 52% of millennials feel that the healthcare system doesn't really meet their needs. Now, while we're seeing a majority of millennials feel that they're healthy, we're seeing early data that says that maybe they're not as healthy as we think, right? And maybe there are some real concerns we need to be considering. So this is a study that came from the Blue Cross Blue Shield um, Foundation. And they essentially assessed, and through interviews, um, you know, the health status and health concerns of millennials. And what they discovered was that millennials today are less healthy than the generation, uh, Gen X, um, when the Gen X was that same age, right? And I think as we kind of unpack this a little bit, we realize that there's a lot of focus on mental health, stress, depression, anxiety, diabetes, and also a disproportionate um, concern um, on the part of women, uh, women, uh, millennial women as well. Now, I, I think that's really important to think about, again, as we think about the size of this population, the impact they have on the workforce, the way they're gonna start shaping and, and through demand about what they expect in the health services, 
is that this is just the tipping point, right? We've been talking about the silver tsunami and when the boomers age. I think we're talking about a similar type of tsunami coming um, for millennials. And so the question is, are, are we prepared, right? This is an opportunity if, if we think about it from a digital health perspective. And I think that we have a fantastic panel to help us unpack that and then talk about uh, how they're approaching um, millennials and the health of millennials, the problems they're seeing, the solutions that they're building, um, and how they kind of uh, keep pace and understand um, this particular, uh, uh, this generation. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to be very brief about introducing our speakers. So I'm going to ask all of you to take, take the time to check the program and take a look and look at their very prestigious uh, and high esteemed uh, bios um, and so you can better understand and kind of where they're coming from and, and what they're doing. But let me just start with Don to my left. Don Wang is the chief product officer for Calm, which is the number one app for meditation and mindfulness. And to her left is Jennifer Tai, the chief operating officer of Glow, which is one of the leading women's health apps. And Glow is, takes a data science approach to women's health, including tracking of periods and fertility windows and much more. Stephanie Nelson to her left is a nutrition science researcher for Under Armour and her focus is on behavior change, content development in Under Armour's health app, um, which is uh, MyFitnessPal. And finally, but not least, is Paul. He's the chief clinical officer for Clinimark. And Clinimark is a specialized clinical lab for medical and consumer grade devices um, for medical device development and regulatory validation. And interestingly, a majority of his subjects are millennials. And so he's had a really interesting opportunity to see uh, the kind of questions that industry is asking about how to better track health for millennials, but also kind of how, how millennials are thinking in a very first-hand way. So let me start with you, Dunn. So, you know, Calm has, I mean, congratulations, has really taken off. It's been a, and has 60, 60 million, 70. It's 60. Okay, soon to be 70 <laughs> million downloads. It's both App of the Year for iOS and Google Play, and it's the millennials who are driving this number. So, first of all, why are millennials so stressed, in your opinion, and why is med meditation so pop it's such a popular way to manage it? So we've, uh, we've spent a lot of time talking to our users and, and listening to feedback. And one theme that we've heard over and over again is that people are just stressed. And they're anxious and they're having trouble sleeping. And there's not really a good solution for that. You know, people don't want to take drugs. They want a natural solution. And so with a digital therapeutic like Calm, that really positions us well. Um, and in terms of Calm in particular, when we started out, a lot of our, a lot of our marketing and messaging was around meditation. And um, around three years ago, we started talking a lot more about the use cases of sleep, stress, and anxiety. And that was when our growth really took off. Um, you know, almost everyone has had trouble sleeping at some point or has experienced stress. Um, so it's very relatable, and there's, there's not really any stigma to talking about those things. And so word of mouth really took off when we started to talk about stress and sleep. Um, so I would say that was the big turning point for Calm. And another big driver of growth for us um, is using celebrities in our content. And that played directly to millennials. Uh, millennials all love celebrities, and you know there are a lot of Instagram influencers that people follow. So when, once we leaned into that as part of the overall experience for both growth and engagement, that really helped us grow as well. Fantastic. And Jen, you know, as, as a physician, you know, I routinely recommend for my young women, my young women patients, to use apps to help kind of track, um, you know, their periods and, and track how they're feeling in their bodies, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's a really important way for them to be mindful of it, but also to be planful around that as well. Now, I know that Glow is taking a very strong data science approach to it, and the, tar and the average user is around 28 years old. Can you talk a little bit about how data science powers your ability to really meet the, the needs of this generation? Sure. Um, yeah, when we started Glow, I, I think, you know, coming into this, the whole intent was to empower people with information about their health and on a subject that, you know, at that point, I think was still fairly taboo to talk about being fertility. And um, in taking a data-driven approach, I think this is one of the things that really helped us to stand out at the beginning because up until then, the assumption was, oh, track your period on a calendar. You assume that you have a 28-day cycle, and that's it. And oh, by the way, if you use an app, it's probably pink and has flowers, right? And so the idea was to actually 
We as a company wanted to take a data-driven approach. The user experience, we wanted it to feel like you know, we, we, you know, we were kind of being respectful of our user base and understood that they also wanted to take a data-driven approach to tracking their fertility. And so that's really kind of how we've gone about doing it. And so we developed you know, our own predictive algorithms to help, um, help uh, track these, these ovulation windows and menstrual cycles. And then with machine learning, re refine those algorithms based on you know, what we're seeing across the anonymized data set, um, but also with respect to what we're seeing for a given individual user's patterns. Um, and so that's really been the spirit you know, from, from day one. And by doing that, I think you know, our users are highly engaged they feel like you know, they actually, for the first time, have the power of this information in their hands. There's less guesswork when it comes to tracking their cycle. But in addition to that, the other piece I would add is from a data standpoint, we, you know, and this kind of harkens back to what you were talking about earlier, Ricky, in terms of the mentality of millennials. Um, the immediacy of information, I think, is really important. And not doing it away in a way that stresses them out because all of a sudden you're searching the internet and one little pain here could be anything from, you know, I don't know, cramps to cancer, right? Um, and so instead, taking the data that we're seeing um, for a given user across our population and then delivering bite-sized pieces of information back to that user right then and there when she is, you know, tracking that information I think has been quite powerful and very satisfying for, for our end users as well. Thanks. Now, Stephanie, I think that when we talk about diet and nutrition, it can very quickly and easily get reduced down to calories, right? This is my calorie goal, this is how many calories I ate this morning, and, and trying to stay below that number. But we all know that actually food is very complicated, right? There's a whole psychology around it. We people eat to, be, to look better, to be healthier, to feel healthier, but also when they're in a, not feeling well or in a bad mood or stress, we've been talking a lot about stress, then they eat, for example. And so can you share a little bit about how you're think, thinking about that as you're developing content um, and behavior change for Under Armour? Absolutely. Um, when people come to our app, they want to be told, um, eat this many calories, eat this amount of macros, and then you're going to reach your health and nutrition goals. The number one goal that our users have is that they want to lose weight, and then their number two goal is that they want to eat healthier. Um, so weight is a really big driver of our user base, but it really is not that simple to just tell millions of people that they should be eating the same amount of calories with the same amount of uh, macro breakdown based on whatever their health or nutrition goal is. It's really not that simple. Um, different, you can eat the same pattern of food. You can eat one food at the same time as somebody else and see different results. Um, and as how it affects your energy levels, your mental health, your physical health, your performance. And it's, it's a very individualized process. So how do we tackle that um, when we're dealing with millions of users as we're trying to develop content for all of them? What we really wanna do is drive behavior change and really get the user to draw inward and think about how what they're eating affects them. Because really at the end of the day, the best diet for you is the one that works. So in all of our content, we're trying to get the user to think, okay, I ate this, and now I'm going to think an hour from now, how do I feel? Do I feel full? Do I feel hungry? Do I feel energized? Do I feel tired? How's my sports performance? How's my mental health doing? And trying to train in that reflection is really what's going to drive the users uh, through success. Thanks. Now, Paul, you're in a really interesting space where you have companies coming to you with interesting questions, right? Please validate my technology um, for millennials. Ask them these questions. And then you're asking them these questions, engaging with the millennials directly, and getting that feedback. And so being at that intersection, can you share a little bit about some of the observations you've had about the generation, millennials as a generation, about their health needs, but also about how they want to be engaged, how to engage health? Right. <clears throat> That's very interesting and exciting space right now because <clears throat> um, what we've looked at in healthcare up to now is uh, measuring parameters. You know, well, let me measure your blood pressure and see if you're healthy, or let me look at your pulse oximetry, or um, what, is, what is your, uh, uh, your use of oxygen in your, in your body? Those are 
the healthcare side of things. They're the parameters. They're the foundations of everything else that we're working on today. You know, these, the developers that are, are doing this now. Um, the, the, the millennials really look for uh, something that's easy, something that's uh, cost effective, and something that's centered around what they're looking for. And what they're looking for, uh, <clears throat> one of the top um, pieces of interest for millennials is experience. They value experience over um, uh, devices, even, or any other possessions um, that than any of the other groups that have come along so far. And so what they want is something that is accurate, obviously, if they're measuring their blood pressure. If it's not accurate or if it, the sleep app doesn't uh, uh, reflect what really goes on for them in their sleep, then they'll drop it like a hot potato. And so those parameters have to be accurate, and that's a whole challenge in itself. But what the uh, millennials are looking forward to and what they want is something that overall, a meta-analysis of all of this stuff that tells them how to be, uh, gives them actionable uh, aspects. For instance, hydration is not a simple uh, aspect, like uh, diet is not simple. There are many aspects to go there, but they want something to tell them that it's time to hydrate so you can finish your EDC party. Uh, and, um, uh, or um, how am I doing on my, on my uh, physical activity scale on my, on my, if I'm exercising? Do I, how much gas do I have in my tank? Um, uh, or just on the health spectrum, am I healthy or am I beginning to get sick? Where am I on that spectrum? And uh, certainly another very strong, important aspect is how do I de-stress? And so they want something that gives them this overview as well as centralizes healthcare for them and makes it easy so they don't necessarily have to go in to a physician's office and wait in a cold uh, you know, waiting room and then have the physician tell them not to, take, not to do tattoos or not to be gay or whatever else it is. Um, and so they want to take control of all this information. And that can be rather complex because uh, healthcare today, many physicians, um, hate the idea of the of masses uh, knowing their own complete physical condition, you know, or knowing all of the, the, the history, because it can make it complex. And so what the millennials are looking for right now is something that takes all of this information and helps them interface with their healthcare practitioner and make it easy, straightforward, and by the way, the millennials are the sole group today that have a very large percentage that is um, willing to allow their healthcare information that may be collected, blood pressure and all of that kind of stuff, sent directly to their physician. I think you unpacked a bunch of really interesting points there that we can just continue riffing on. I mean, let's just talk about wearables, for example, right? You know, how are you, you know, I think there's an opportunity when we think about engagement, data collection, and just like we were talking about for that cardiac rehab program, collecting data, sharing back data, an opportunity to collect feedback um, from the user. How are your companies thinking about wearables, IoT, and some of those other technologies to help drive that engagement and to make that experience more personalized um, as they continue to use your services? I'll, I'll go ahead and start. I mean, I, I, so I think for, for us, for quite a while, actually, we've always we've thought about wearables as a terrific way to enhance the view that one has of one's health, right? Um, it's very much additive to what someone can track, right? So from, from Glow's standpoint, when we think about um, tracking, there's active tracking that a user opens up you know, our app, enters in information, tracks that over time, multiple times a day sometimes. Um, but you can only track so many things, right? And do it accurately. Um, whereas wearables, I mean, if we, we kind of think about the data that comes in from wearables, wearables is almost, it's like passive tracking. All of a sudden you can pull in all these other pieces of information and they're being measured, you know, they may not be perfect, but at least, you know, if you can start, but with the technology and improvements that are happening every day, the accuracy of that data will get better and better and you really start to have a much more complete picture. So all of a sudden, it's much easier to incorporate information about your sleep, about steps, you know, kind of the basic things that have been done today, but that will take it, you know, even much further. And at least from a reproductive health standpoint, when we can layer that on onto the other factors that 
uh, our users are tracking, all of a sudden you have a much more complete view on what might be impacting one cycle. Stress, activity, sleep, you know, whatnot, all of those things, blood pressure and whatnot. So I, that's kind of how we think about it at GLOW, active and passive tracking, but really all um, ultimately adding to the data set that we have about your health. Do you, I mean, Paul, are you seeing, what are some of the interesting use cases you're seeing uh, that are being tested with wearables for, uh, uh, for health? <coughs> right. <coughs> wearables for health. Um, wearables, um, you know, hearables, knowables. You know, we're moving beyond the, the phone. And there's a tremendous uh, a, a amount of activity in the space right now. Um, there's a, the, the, the bad news is that the technologies that we have today are not perfect, as you, as you mentioned. The good news is <clears throat> there is a tremendous amount of pressure and a tremendous amount of activity to leap forward. You know, the ideas and the concepts and the needs <clears throat> have, leapfrogged, have leapfrogged the technology. And now it, the technology is being pushed slowly to, to uh, improve. The biggest problem with wearables is movement. Yeah, there's a big difference, and in, in when you go to the physician's office, you sit very still, they take your blood pressure, you hold your finger still, they take your pulse oximeter, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> the signal <clears throat> of a, a pulse oximeter on the finger, the traditional site, is amplified about a million times. And if you move to the wrist, it's, uh, the signal decreases 10 times from that. So it's a real problem. And um, one of the aspects of medical technology is that usually uh, a type of technology will take about 50 years, if you can believe that, to be replaced by something that is significantly different. Uh, for instance, blood pressure. Uh, well, that was first described back in the late 1800s. Pulse oximetry was, <coughs> well, the oximeter was first used, um, uh, invented by Millikan uh, for in World War II. And so we're still using that. So we're just at the cusp now, at the time where <clears throat> if, that, uh, if that holds true, we should be moving into some very exciting technologies. And so uh, that's what's going on right now, of all these pressures. And um, there's a tremendous amount of work going on in doing the basics, the fundamentals, so that then the meta-analysis can really provide information to the user. You know, Stephanie mentioned a little bit earlier about behavior change. And I think at the end of the day, that's what we're really talking about, how to guide people to, uh, to set and do things differently, even without the apps and services and wearables that we're offering for them. Can, would you mind sharing a little bit about how you're thinking about behavior change? Is it about the tone of the message that people want to hear? Is it about communities, right, and using social to, to compete or to have the right accountabil you know, accountability partner or someone to talk to um, and to be able to share those ideas all, along the way? Actually, I think there are many of you that could probably speak to this, and maybe Stephanie could start. Sure. So um, I think the, the biggest thing that drives engagement, especially with millennials, um, is results. And because millennials want instantaneous feedback, they want to try something new and see results right away. Um, and instantaneous results are usually not the um, outcome from behavior change, and it's more of like a stopgap solution. You know, we see a lot of these crazy crash diets that people do, I and mean, they do them because it gives you immediate results. But in, in the end, it's not sustainable. So, um, what we, the challenge that we have is giving people immediate results on top of building in these behavior changes. And those are the things that they can take with them once they've stopped these immediate results. These things are getting immediate results. So for example, we have um, nutrition plans that people can go on on MyFitnessPal. And um, what we do is we give them, they can do whatever diet they want. We have something as simple as one that get, gets you to eat more fruits and vegetables. And then we have other ones that are more complicated, um, like a high protein plan where you're really paying attention to your macro breakdown. But um, they, they can have the immediate effects of whatever diet it is that they're looking for. Um, on top of that, they have a checklist. So they, you know, every day you have to do four things on, on the plan. And so every day you get four times a day the satisfaction of checking that off. And that instantaneous feedback is something that really works well for millennials. 
But then in all of those tasks, there are things like reflect on how your lunch made you feel for the rest of the day. And so when they finish the plan, they have the immediate um, feedback that they're looking for as well as building in the behavior change that we're trying to get from them so they can be successful down the road. Fantastic. Jen, do you want to share a little bit about how we're using communities and some of the other, um, as uh, other features um, of GLOW to help kind of be able to drive behavior change or an engagement? Sure, absolutely. Um, so yes, within the, our, our platform of Glow apps, um, we also have an in-app forum, essentially a community. And um, we started that community, th those communities pretty early on. And the notion was, it, I mean, in a nutshell, I think um, when done well, it can be quite effective in keeping people engaged, right? And so if you, they come, continue to stay engaged, there are you know, there's all, multiple reasons now for them to open up the app. Of course, one of them being to continue to track their health. Um, but the communities that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in terms of driving engagement, I mean, it's really, I mean, these are communities that uh, we've created a very safe um, environment for people to share and ask pretty much anything and everything, right? And what I think, um, and I think this goes beyond reproductive health, but for any topic that is perhaps taboo, difficult to talk about, or one where you feel somewhat alone, right? And there aren't necessarily others right around you who are experiencing the same thing. Finding that a community of others who are in that same situation or maybe have walked in your steps is incredibly powerful. Um, and so that's what we see within our community. And we have users, you know, literally on opposite sides of the world who are making connections within the community because they're going through the same thing and these friendships are formed. It's pretty amazing. Um, but so, I mean, it's obviously, you know, it's really, I think, you know, rewarding and, and helpful for our users and certainly from, you know, kind of our, our perspective, but from GLOW's perspective in terms of continuing to drive engagement and retention, it's a very effective uh, tool as well. And so, Don, how has Calm thought about staying in, I mean, oh, I'm stressed, I should use the meditation. It's like, that doesn't really come across sometimes. But at the same time, you don't want to hit them with notifications throughout the day. Hey, are you stressed? Hey, are you stressed? <laughs> it's stressful to get those notifications. So how have you been thinking about designing uh, appropriately for that? So our features are designed for habit formation. Um, and uh, our, so our two flagship features, one is called the Daily Calm, and one is called Sleep Story. So the Daily Calm, um, probably pretty self-explanatory, but it's a daily meditation that you do every morning, and we help people fit that into their morning routine. Um, there's a lot of science that says that you can form a habit if you attach a new activity to an existing habit. So there's a lot of education around, okay, you're gonna do this right when you wake up or after you brush your teeth, um, and then really helping people with that daily habit with fresh content every day. Um, and so therefore, we don't have to rely on push notifications or people remembering. It's just part of their daily routine. Um, our other feature, sleep stories, is basically bedtime stories. So people are already going to bed every night. Um, it's typically already a routine for people. You know, maybe they brush their teeth, change into their pajamas. So we just help them incorporate sleep stories into that, just a bedtime routine. Um, a lot of us probably have unhealthy bedtime routines of scrolling through social media or trying to fire off one last email. So um, we're just trying to help people set better routines and, and better habits. Fantastic. I would just, uh, this is probably not appropriate, but I was just thinking that one Samuel Jackson um, video, she, he's reading this book called Go the F to Sleep. And this is kind of like parents who are like trying to get their kids to sleep <laughs> and just please go to bed. And that'd be, okay, anyway. Shouldn't, don't do that for, for Tom, but it would be, it would be hilarious. Maybe just as a that April Fool's one. That would be one. a sleep story. Yeah, uh, that would be a lot of fun. Um, you, know, you know, data security and privacy is super important right now. We're talking a lot, the, we're all talking about it. You know, politicians are talking about it. And Samsung takes it extremely, extremely uh, uh, as a high priority. And so, you know, a, a couple of years back, um, you know, Consumer Reports um, actually did an evaluation of Glow and shared some feedback around that. And, and you came out stronger on the other side of it. And so could you share a little bit about that experience and some of the key lessons you learned? Sure. Uh, so I think this was about uh, over three years ago. Consumer Reports came to us and shared results of the, some security tests that they had done. And uh, certainly, you know, very concerning to us as soon as it was raised. And, um, and, and so our t we did a couple of things. One is we you know, kind of looked into it and started our team, you know, placed the high priority on 
addressing these issues. Um, and, and, you know, to be honest, I mean, it was, a, it was definitely a challenging few days. Um, over the course of a, about a couple of days, two days or three, two to three days, we were able to address most of those issues and get fixes out. And in the uh, in about kind of a week's time or so, you know, it took some time for kind of app updates to be uh, to be released. Um, but all the other issues had been addressed. Um, but that certainly wasn't. I mean, it wasn't a you know it wasn't enough for us um, because. Um, we wanted to main, we want to maintain users' trust in us, and you know they are entrusting us with very personal information about their health. So we, you know, some said we kind of maybe went to the other extreme. Um, we had we then decided to conduct a third-party security audit, um, and you know I should note that actually so through all that you know when this was flagged, no no users' data were, were, was compromised. These were kind of potential you know, areas uh, where there, there, there could be issues, but no actual user's data was, was compromised. However, you know, we said, said, well, let's do a full security audit, let's get third party to conduct it. Um, and in addition to that, we decided to go through the process of becoming HIPAA compliant, which wasn't required, right, certainly, um, or necessary, but we just thought that it was the best thing to do and it would give us comfort. We certainly wanted to make sure that we could um, ensure that our users continue to trust us as well. So since the beginning of 2017, we've been HIPAA compliant, um, and it's been, I mean, it, it, you know, overall, while it was a challenging kind of period, it was a, it was a really good experience, you know, made us ultimately better and stronger, I think, from a, from a security and privacy standpoint, but it's something we certainly continue to look very closely at every day. I would imagine that being, becoming HIPAA compliant is, or going through that process, is a time-consuming one for a startup, it's a resource heavy at the same time. On the upside, it could create an opportunity for differentiation or position you to be able to take on some more sensitive or interesting directions that you would not be able to without being HIPAA compliant. Yeah. Have, you, have you found that to be the case? Absolutely. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it takes time. At first, our, our, our team was very, very, you know, found, found the notion pretty daunting. And, you know, we are, uh, as a small startup, I mean, we have limited resources, but it was just something we kind of came up with a plan on how to prioritize how to work it in and what impact that had on um, other, you know, our product roadmap and other activities that were in place. And so, you know, once we had that, we just kind of followed that plan. Um, but it, but you're right. It's actually also enabled us to um, distinguish. You know, we are. I, I think you know we were quite proud to say that we were the only HIPAA compliant app. You know, kind of in in the space. Um, and when it came to talking to other entities, I mean, certainly the trust with our individual users was quite important. Um, but we actually found that then when other businesses and enterprises came to talk to us, they actually found this to be quite valuable, right? It made it much easier for us to kind of engage with, for instance, healthcare providers, clinicians, and things like that um, who were interested in partnering with us by just kind of having that already in place. So. Fantastic. Now, I think that, I mean, you touched on a really important point where, you know, health is a little bit different from the other industries, right? Trust and credibility is critical, right? And, uh, and I think that sometimes it does influence your decision, your business decisions around it, right? Do I do ads next to my content, you know, for example, or, um, and, and think about, really carefully about, you know, those, the pros and cons and, and, and weighing that as well. You know, there's a lot of noise. I think when, like, one of the things I hate most is when patients come in and saying, I Googled this thing, and it's like far off left field crazy stuff that is, has no credibility or information behind it, and I have to kind of work to kind of set that story straight. But when we think about contents and we think about some of the, and, and our reputations, you know, what are some of the ways and approaches you've taken to try to protect or enhance the credibility of what you do and stay kind of above some of that noise of misinformation or even um, competitors? And that's kind of open for any of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll start from one end, and uh, my colleagues here uh, will go to the other end. Uh, basically, the, the, uh, the basic of what I do, uh, I'm the gatekeeper for these parameters, for these technologies. And um, in one way, uh, my, uh, my team may disagree with me, but um, I, it, it makes it easier for us because a lot of the stuff we do is, uh, you know, international standards organization compliant or required by that. And so it's very clear guidelines of what to do and how to do that. And so that's what we put out. 
anything that comes through our group and is tested uh, is ready for, um, uh, for prime time use. And, uh, you know, the, in many ways, the, the FDA is considered the gold standard for the world. And uh, groups come from all over the world just to go through the FDA um, uh, process. And so that's what starts the foundation of quality and what the user can trust. And then we hand it over to the brains here and uh, my colleagues here. Yeah, I think uh, one thing I'd love to throw in there is having a, um, a really high set of standards for our own content. Um, any uh, food company that wants to um, advertise with us has to get my approval first. Um, as a dietitian, I have a very high standard of what I would recommend. Um, and it's not just something that I feel um, doesn't hurt you, but it's something that helps you reach your health and nutrition goal. Um, so setting really high standards really gives our users faith that we are only providing them with the absolute best um, for their health and fitness goals. And it's not just something that's going to not hurt them, but it's actually going to help them reach whatever goal it is that they're trying to get to. Um, I, you know, I think what Stephanie said was a really good point, and that's you know how we approach the um, content, the professional content that we might share within our apps. Um, but in addition to that, since we do have a community, right? There's a lot of user-generated content in there, and um, and so that is a fine balance, right? We want to create a space where people can seek out information, share information. But you know, in terms of misinformation, that that can be a challenge and a risk as well. And so, um, we've you know we we've gone about it by setting very clear rules um, within the community. And if if someone doesn't follow those rules, there actually are consequences. I sound like a parent now, but um, but there but there really are. Um, you know, we have moderators who are um, actively involved in kind of keeping an eye on the community 24 seven. But in addition to that, I think, again, this is sort of that notion of trust. We've actually also entrusted our users, many of whom who care very passionately about the community and what's happening in there, so that they actually can also flag certain things to us as well. So it is not necessarily just a one, you know, kind of one, one, one approach or one, one solution um, that helps us manage that community content. It really is about leveraging, I think, all the different people who actually really care about the community as well. Yeah, and, and for us, it's, it's not as relevant because we've deliberately stayed away from community and advertising. Um, so all of our content is, is columns, proprietary content. So we've been able to keep a close eye on quality. And, um, and we're, we're also not giving out health or medical advice. So it's a little different. Fantastic. Well, we have a couple minutes left. And I did want to reserve that for any questions from the audience. And, and the, we have a mic up front here in the middle. So you can just step up there and, uh, and, uh, and offer your question. I can also run a mic to you if you're a little shy about getting up and standing in front of everybody. Okay, here's it. Great panel so far, thank you very much. Um, I've got a question about how you think about sharing data with healthcare professionals in terms of whether it's um, a psychologist or therapist, if somebody has anxiety and they're working with Calm or uh, an, an OB uh, in, the, in the case of Glow, do you, are you looking to engage with them and bring them into the app as well? Or what are your thoughts around that? Um, so for Calm, it would have to be very much driven by the user. So we give people access to their data and they, many of them do share it with their therapists or coaches. Um, but it, it's not really up to us to do any kind of sharing for them. No. Yeah, yeah and similarly with Glow, um, same thing. So we've created tools that enable users to very easily summarize their data and visualize data trends um, so that if they want to share it with their healthcare providers, they can, but we don't facilitate it. Yeah, same with MyFitnessPal, but the, the really cool thing that we do offer is um, if a person is on, for example, a heart healthy diet, they're trying to get their blood pressure down or whatever, um, we do allow for them to see these like, very specific nutrients that are important for controlling 
that so they can, they can focus specifically on their saturated fat content, their sodium content, and then they can, so if their doctor tells them that that's important, they then have the tools to be able to track that more closely.